Hi, I'm Anuradha Varma, and today I'm talking to Olivia Fraser, an artist who divides her time between New Delhi and London. Hi, Olivia. Hi there. Hello. <laughs> yeah, great to have you here, and I can't wait to talk about you know all the wonderful work you've done in your you know long career. So uh, let me start by asking you. Said that you know you're busy. You're still in London right now. Otherwise, you'd have been back in India by this time. So, uh, what is an artist's life like? What is your day like? How does it work? How does it work? Well, I suppose possibly like anybody else who works. Uh, you know, I get up in the morning and I go to my studio, and um, you know, there's emails to do. There's all the rest of it. Um, there's, um, um, but I, I, I try. I have a kind of thinking chair as well in my studio, which I sit and I think. Uh, I need to have a, a, you know, it's not all about. If you're an artist, it's for me. It's not all about just creating and creating and creating. It's also about thinking, and and thoughts that don't necessarily go anywhere and reading. So I do a lot of research. I read a lot of um, poetry. I read a lot of, um, um, you know, texts that have been translated. I don't speak Sanskrit, but texts that have been translated from the Sanskrit into English. I, um, I, um, I, I look at art books. I, um, I, go, I go for walks. I, you know, it's that whole business of how do you find inspiration? How does anybody find inspiration? Sometimes, sometimes it just creeps on you unawares. You're, you're, you're suddenly having a conversation with somebody, and you suddenly think, "Yes, I've got to get this idea down right now." Or it's just a question of sitting in front of that blank sheet of paper, which I do, and and doing something perhaps that I've done so many times before, but then it tiny it shifts in a tiny micro way, and you think. Yes, that's another way of trying to say what I'm always trying to say, or or trying to say something in a different kind of way. Um, and so, yeah, I I um, divide my time between UK and um, India. But I suppose in India, I I um, my working day doesn't really take into account weekends. There's no such thing for me really as a weekend. I just keep working, and sometimes the work just doesn't come out <laughs> nothing happens i'm just in that kind of i don't know this 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 zero space where hopefully things are happening but they they possibly are without my knowing it kind of thing but otherwise i you know it it's um it's it's a you know question of getting your hands dirty with with the pigments and getting on with it drawing out these um these ideas on this wonderful paper called butter paper is what I do. It's the kind of the first stage for me of, of the process of this traditional art form that I have um, learned since my time in India, um, which um, goes back so many hundreds of years. And it's, and it's you know, you, they, it's normally on this tiny scale, you know, miniature painting, you think of as a tiny thing. Um, but also it's um, it comes from the word minium, which is a form of ink. So it's not necessarily... It's also about materials. It's about process. It's about, um, and and that's when I've spoken and talked with kind of traditional artists. And it, you know, the word miniature doesn't necessarily mean size. And I'm doing things on quite a large scale, but all all everything is all handmade. Um, and um, so it's as I say about the, my day. It's a question of you know going through the stages, going through the processes. But of course, you know, you don't go through the whole thing in one day necessarily. You're just you're going step by step, um, slowly, and you're hoping that that the ideas that you have initially will 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 will, will blossom, will will fruit into something that's 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 uh, something that you conceived initially, but possibly even better than you hopefully conceived. You know, um, and so you have to you have to you know, the, the process starts with um, with drawing everything out. On this, what, what's called butter paper, this this um, this transparent paper, um, which is shiny on one side and 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 opaque on the other, or matte on the other, I should say, um, and um, it's it's wonderful paper that that's also used for uh, at a later stage, at a later stage in the process of creating this this artwork artwork. Um, so you use it for creating a, a you know your basic motif your 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 you know what you're thinking about um and you can change it and obviously you know 
it, that's that's where you create past, perhaps all the mess and the and the <laughs> kind of issues and the problem and you're trying to get something and you're reaching towards it and it doesn't necessarily always always work but that's where I do all the messiness and then after that once I've come up with whatever it is that that is you know what I'm trying to get at the next stage is preparing your paper and it's handmade everything is handmade um and um so the handmade paper you have to burnish so that's an um burnishing is another part of the process which I really love and you you have a, a, a agate stone um this smooth lovely stone uh, funnily enough my aunt used to collect them um and in the yes, UK yes I saw because even your paper is handmade and uh, there's stone uh, pigmentation that you use there's indigo yeah. that is so so do you do all of it yourself and I saw there's also uh, gold leaf and uh, yeah. Arabic gum <laughs> you know, yeah, a lot of right. materials that's right I have a couple of uh, assistants who help me I also have people in uh, some friends in Jaipur where I source my materials and um they are, um, you know, it's wonderful going down, you know, going down into, you know, almost Harry Potter like diagonal alley where you go into one of these pansari shops and you don't know what you're going to find. And you go with, um, you know, and you go and have a look and you open one of the, the drawers in the shops and it could be a kind of root or it could be a rock or it could be, you know, dried petals or it could be some sort of a, um, I don't know, a paste or something. You, you just don't really know it's it's got this fantastic kind of um you know it, it's for people who are in the know kind of thing it's for the it's for the those who are doing homeopathy they go to the pansari shops those who um are, are, are artists those who are you know it's, it's medical art and um it, it, and it i get very excited about going to these shops and then you choose your pigment in its rawest form and then you know i get somebody to I, myself and various other artists we kind of group together and someone grinds it for all of us and um and we get this extraordinary pigment um so malachite for example it's also jaipur is one of these places that because it's the um where i get the pigments it's because it's the center of the gem trade so there's a lot of kind of off cuts of 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 all these semi precious stones that are normally sold in 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 jewelry and sometimes, you know, the 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 you know the the jewelers, they cut things into such small awkward shapes or whatever they can't be used anymore. And so then they hand them over. Often I've been handed over by jewelers, I handed over a bag of kind of old malachite or whatever, and say, "Do you want to use that or whatever?" Um, so that kind of thing. And then you get that ground down. Um, and then sometimes you need to grind it a bit more, uh, you know. But but the idea is that you're using this 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 raw pigment. And indigo is one of my total top favorites that's one of the that comes obviously from a plant and there you use layer upon layer upon layer in a very thin thin way but you mix all these pigments with um with arabic gum which again you have to you you're you're a little bit as an artist you're a little bit like a chemist you have to kind of mix everything to its right consistency you have to make sure that the gum arabic is is you know anyway you get the right consistency between gum and, and pigment um and that's the binder um and then um yeah and then then you use that as your as your as your paint and then the gold leaf oh, i love gold um <laughs> it's one of my favorite things i love how it's used in in india i love how it's kind of obviously it's so much part of the jewelry women wear bangles and you know and earrings of about gold but also how it's um used in in a sacred context obviously with um some, some of the um idols being being gold or silver leaf um and um obviously in the miniature painting tradition that that's one of the key elements there we, which has been from from you know many centuries ago and i love using gold leaf i love i don't know i just um i love trying to you know paint on top of it paint underneath it i don't know just playing with it um and just seeing the kind of the you know how when you hold one of the traditional way of looking at a miniature back in the day was not that you put it up on the wall in a frame but it was handed from person to person and, and you'd you would hold it up and tilt it towards the light and because of once you put your your um your your pigments down which um you then burnish them that was uh, you know, with this agate stone <clears throat> but you burnish on the back or with something that protects the color 
And that brings out, it fuses the pigment and brings out an extraordinary kind of, um, I don't know, almost, almost makes it back into its natural sort of rock luster or, or pigment luster. Uh, and you can see this particularly by holding it up to the light and, and shifting it with your with your under your hands. And that's how originally these these paintings were looked at. And of course, gold or silver does that even more, you know. But it again, it changes as according to the direction of the light and how how you look at it. And I, I love that. I think it's uh, it's got a wonderful quality. Um, so yes, yeah, so that so all these pigments and materials and the brushes and um everything comes comes from from Jaipur and I spend all my um basically my 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 Indian part of my life my when I'm in in, in India is is just well unless I'm going away somewhere it's just work 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 and then I come back to England and I do things on a smaller scale uh, I have a smaller studio here and um and it's it's possibly more reading up going to going to reading up books um about painting going to exhibitions, um, thinking about, you know, trying to come up with all these ideas and also painting on a smaller scale. And some of my some of my images are multiples on a small scale, but multiples. Um, so um, that's how my my day slash year works out. <laughs> Yeah, that's wonderful. And what you say, I think it sounds a lot like even when you're not working, you're working, right? It's the yeah, entire. You never aren't. You never aren't. It's it's um, you know some of my family sort of say, "Mum, you're just sitting in a chair," and I say, "Well, yes," <laughs> you know, because because you it's 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 about your life always. It's about who you are, kind of thing that comes out in anybody's you know whether they're writer, painter, whatever they are. And that's your artist. work chair, you said. It's your thinking chair. And it's it's your work chair. It's my, I have a thinking chair in India and I have one here. <laughs> um, and I need to think in it. And it's, it's I don't know, it's it's somehow, it's what I have. My father used to have one as well, I remember. There was always one place he would sit in the house. Um, and uh, that's how I always picture him. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's something I, I, I I very much need my just my my time when I can hopefully just switch everything or all that outside noise off um and just sort of think and hope <laughs> think and hope that this you know that uh, just think about and, and juggle ideas yeah it's also very interesting what you said that, you know, an artist is like a chemist. So when you're mixing mm. all those pigments together, all those stone and everything else together, you're coming up with something completely new, almost like a new element. And uh, well, exactly. You know, yeah. And your paintings have that yeah. burnished gem like quality also. Right. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're obviously, well, they're not obviously, but they are on a larger scale. So this whole business of tilting the painting to the light doesn't necessarily happen. Although as I paint it, um, and the light crosses the sky behind uh, behind my studio. I I see it in a different way. And if you try and look at it in 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 Delhi, I have a um, you know doors that open from my studio outside onto a terrace. And so I sometimes I look at it inside, and then I take it outside, and it's completely different. The color has completely. Um, totally changes to my eyes um, and it's 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 very exciting seeing that transformation that sort of happens with just light on on your own work on on what you've 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 done you know um, that I find lovely too um, yeah that's beautiful because you created something and then nature's creating something else out of it so <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So uh, tell me, you know, um, uh, uh, you came to India, you know, because uh, I think you were inspired by your ancestor. And uh, after that, uh, you were interested in Mughal miniature, the, the company school, right? And the Fraser collection that he had. You can tell us more about that. And uh, later you got inspired by the miniature, Jaipur, etc. Miniature. Yes. So, you know, so how you started and what made you fall in love with the Jaipur tradition? So, so I came to India actually having no interest in coming to India because my then boyfriend, my now husband, uh, had got his job in India and we had gone to a wedding or something. And um, these these two had talked about how long distance relationships were very difficult or whatever. And so my my then boyfriend and I, Willie and I, just said, well, we, we just can't be having a long distance relationship. And so off I 
packed. I got rid of my, uh, you know, I I, re I rejected my place at art school. I'd done only a year and I put it to one side and said, right, I'm going to jump into the unknown. And I went to India <laughs> and instantly got viral fever, instantly kind of lost all my luggage, um, instantly, you know, it was a bit of a crash landing. Um, but um, from there, I found India the most extraordinarily receptive place it was in 1989 and so many people were sort of enthusiastic there was I this young 20 something young 20 year old and um people were incredibly enthusiastic kind I don't know generous I don't know what but they but I think I felt that there was this buzz this buzz about the art world um about people saying you know let's have a show here, let's have a show here. There's, a, there's just kind of art galleries were opening up all over the place. So I had my first show in Delhi um, and that was following having um, brought out, my husband gave to me, my then Willie gave to me this book by, by, about my forebears, my kinsmen rather than forebears. They're um, not my direct, I'm not the direct descendant of James Bailey Fraser, who was this uh, early 19th century artist who came to, came to India with, along with his three other brothers um, and all of them died apart from him out in India. Um, and they all worked for the East India Company. And um, particularly there was one William Fraser who was the, like the ambassador of Delhi. He was the British resident in Delhi for a long time and um, absolutely loved the country and became what, what's known as a white Mughal who kind of, you know, he had Indian wives and he spoke fluent um, Urdu and all the rest of it. Um, and just loved the entire culture of, of, of India. But the brother, James, um, was uh, was an artist, and he ca came out to he, um, he came out to paint India and create all these lithographs of of kind of uh, um, Calcutta, the scenes scenes of the of the city and of the Himalayas, um, you know, landscape paintings. And he wrote in his letters back home um, that he had intended to, he went to stay with his brother, you know, the resident in Delhi, William, and he, he'd intended to paint Delhi, the buildings of Delhi, never got around to it. And so I thought, well, this is a good place to start, you know, this 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 kind of um, kinsman of mine who went out to India, who, who, who loved India and spent a long time there, but finally he went back home to Scotland. But... Um, um, but he never got around to painting Delhi. He also, what I found even more exciting was between the two of them, James and William, they commissioned this series of paintings from local artists, which became known as, has become known as the Fraser album of people. James was not a very good painter of people. He was good at landscapes, but not so much of people. And I think he wanted to use these, these miniature paintings, these small, what have been come, become known as company school paintings of of uh, people against stark white backgrounds, they're they're um, showing their caste, their their what you know their the jobs that they did, uh, the type of person they were, where they were from. It was all about, um, in a way, it was it was kind of a sort of scientific view of of the different kinds of people you come across in India, um, and he was going to use these, I think, as it, it, in his paintings, you know, later sort of put them in, in himself, people with different, I don't know, um, but he never got around to doing that. And what, in fact, what happened instead was that um, these um, extraordinary paintings were bound into a volume, became known as the phrase, has, has become known as the Fraser album. Um, and um, they're all in this book. And I was just amazed by it. I loved the kind of, it was a sort of um, hybrid or kind of, it was half, it felt very much where the East and West were sort of meeting to create these, these paintings of people um, where they had slightly, they had an Indian sort of vision of how to do, how to, how to create a kind of, I suppose, it, is it the, the rhythm in, in the brush strokes or something? Um, but against this this very flat or, or non-existent background, um, white background, and I sort of tried. To, that was my way in as well to start off with. I decided to create just groups of people um, from life, and I would sit in the streets of Delhi. And actually, we travelled an awful lot around India, so I'd just take my paintings with me and um, paint just scenes of people 
but and I created my own version of what I call miniature painting then. But instead of doing kind of you know what what I had seen as miniature painting in the National Museum and got very excited about in in Delhi, which was kind of um, paintings about the court, courtly life, or kind of emperors, or kind of princes, or Krishna and Radha, and all that kind of thing. Instead of that, I was doing you know the people I came across, the people in the streets, the people in the fields. Um, um, the people just sitting next near me in the park or in front of buildings or whatever. Um, that was my that was my subject matter. But after about sort of um, ten years and after family and all that kind of thing, I decided I wanted to sort of you know really plunge in a bit more deeply um, and actually learn the traditional techniques because. I was using my my having lived there for a while my my watercolor technique, which is what I've been using to start off with. Um, I suppose inspired by James Bailey Fraser and his watercolors instant, initially. But I was trying to kind of just put layer upon layer upon layer, trying to get this kind of exciting, you know, color, Indian color out of the watercolors by just you know increasing the layers. But I just felt it wasn't enough, um, and so I. Um, became a, a sort of an apprentice, I suppose. Um, first of all, to somebody in Jaipur, who I was put in touch with, and um, he introduced me to the whole business of, you know, creating something out of the landscape around you, which I just thought was so exciting. It made me very much feel, it made me feel so grounded to feel that, you know, that tree over there just just through that window, Olivia, that tree over there, we get that sap from that tree and we're going to use that in, in this sort of thing. And then this pot here, open up the lid. This is where I've been burning an oil lamp all night. Look at the lid inside. It's all black. That's the soot. That's the cudgel, which we can use for eyes, but also we'll use it for lining, um, for line work. And then it was just, it, it felt so. And then the cliffs over there, as, as you came into Jaipur, you may have seen the Aravali Hills, those cliffs, they, they have this white chalk and it's called Kadia. Um, and and this, this white chalk is this absolutely is rather like powder when you crush it. Um, but it's got this, um, it's got this, uh, um, I mean, it varies obviously in, in, in color, but for me, it's, it's a sort of slightly off white it's a very gentle white, which I absolutely adore. Um, anyway, and so all these things all together, I got so excited about. And then using the the one haired brushes, which um, which end with one hair and have a slightly kind of curved, kind of springy nature, which have an ability, almost an ability in themselves to create these perfect little little circles. It's almost painting the painting with your breath. So you have to breathe with it. And then that helps steady the, the line and create these circles, create the kind of the 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 the, the arcs that you that I kind of want to create. Um all of this I got very excited about and I was learning on a very small scale in, in Jaipur, but I had my family in Delhi and I found somewhere very amazingly in Delhi that was doing, um, there was a sort of, um, you know, workshop or painter's, painter's studio. Um, and, and the painter had various, you know, um, traditional artists um, working there. Um, and I just sat there with the artists and sat on the floor and it was kind of 40 degrees. It was May heat. I'm normally rather susceptible to the heat. I'm this useless, you know, person from the northern hemisphere who normally can't cope but I didn't mind a bit because I was so excited um because the um the the what I was learning from almost a process of osmosis because there was a language thing my, back in those days perhaps I mean I do speak of Hindi but but uh, I, my Hindi was less good then um and it, but it was the language of painting and it was the language of of creation and creating together and of feeling that you're in a, a space where people understand because you you've all got the same you're 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 trying for the same thing um and so i i wasn't working with them on what they were working i was doing my own thing of creating something 
Um, but I, I eventually kind of got up the, um, how do I say that? Is it the confidence or something to start doing something on a larger scale? I forgot to say this was a pitch white painting, um, a pitch white painting, a studio. So every, everything they were doing was with the same techniques, the same materials, the same uh, process. Everything was the same, but it was on a large scale because pitch wise are from um, they're called that they're like backdrops, temple backdrops, and there's a sp specific um, um, place which is in uh, in Udaipur outside of Udaipur called Natadvara, and it's that they are they are um, temple backdrops for the kind of for bhakti for for devotion and devotional paintings that are used behind Krishna. Um, in in um, and, and so they're very large in order to have the Krishna Murti, the image in front, um, and they have a, a whole lot of rules and regulations um, um, behind their creation, because everything this is sacred art, and actually you go across the globe and you find sacred art across the globe has the same thing. Everything means something, and I love that. I love learning the 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 meanings learning the the iconography learning how to talk in that way um and partly because um there's this whole idea as well which i'd um one of the pa uh, painters i was working with was saying no work is worship um and i loved that idea and it so felt it it so felt as if it 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 really actually mattered and um and what I also liked was the, the, the kind of confidence behind um, th this imagery as well. There was a kind of um, um, the way that I painted before, you know, when I'd done painting from life, um, first of all, with watercolour, painting the scenes and, and um, doing uh, architectural elevations I painted as well, all with watercolour. That had been um, a totally different kind of painting. This This one was this that was about you know looking measuring you know seeing if you're trying to get the perspective right it was all kind of very um uh, can i say western gaze i don't know um whereas this was more of a internal form of perception where there was when i suggested first of all i remember the first thing i wanted to learn to paint was a banana tree and I said, shall I go out and find a banana tree? There's lots of them in Delhi. Shall I go out and find one, sketch one, and then come back and we can, I don't know, do something? And they said, no, no, there is only one way of doing a banana tree. There is only one way of doing a banana leaf. And you have to look inside. And it's and and you have to know and understand that there is, it's like a language. And I love that. And you can see it when you go and see Pichai painting. And I hadn't realized before I joined the studio, you know, I looked through many, many books and all that, and I hadn't realized that I'd always landed on these pitch wise. I'd always been excited by the iconography, by the confidence in it, by the fact that leaves seem to dance, that kind of, I don't know, it, it, there's something that, that that within its iconography, I felt, you know, I don't know, a, a, an attraction to, or kind of, I don't know, something that made sense for me. And so that's been my starting point. And from from there, um, I um, I having you know learnt and been in that studio for quite a while. I then um, you know carried on working in my own home and um, you know started getting larger pieces of handmade paper. You know doing all the all of that process and creating my own vocabulary and then sort of working out in a way what I was wanting to talk about my story um my what makes me tick or something um and so I wanted to use this vocabulary and sort of possibly pull it apart and um you know but with respect kind of thing I'm not trying to kind of throw it at the wall or anything like that I would, with respect but sort of trying to say something that that uh, it combines what who I am you know I'm somebody from the west and this is something that's from specifically kind of you know subcontinent and and you know trying to kind of make that merge and show some sort of a I don't know symbiosis or something that could make sense for me being there it was a form of I suppose rootedness it is a form of me feeling being able to feel uh, rooted and connected and um uh, but also trying to bring it into a, a different sort of um 
well, anyway, I, I am now showing in con contemporary art show, art galleries and and all that kind of thing. So I don't know. <laughs> anyway, sorry yeah. for nothing on. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm um, completely, uh, what do I say? I can't, I'm totally mesmerized by what you're saying. <laughs> Just, <laughs> it, it's beautiful. It's all coming together like a story. And it's so wonderful because, you know, you said that uh, you came here, you just followed your boyfriend and then husband, the very celebrated William Dalrymple, the author. And uh, mm -hmm. you just threw yourself into the chaos. Just, you know, it's a leap of faith. And yes. then, uh, you know, you're trying to find... <laughs> <laughs> ill yeah. instantly and with no suitcase and instantly yeah. ill he was instantly ill it was quite a start yeah exactly so you know after that and then you're trying to you know do the watercolors of uh, uh, you know your uh, uh, you know relative uh, James Fraser and then you know finding something's lacking and then you you know from that chaos you feel you find like you know you're saying you feel rootedness in this mm -hmm. miniature tradition that you find and you find your own language it's it's, yeah. it's uh, wonderfully it's all come together so uh, <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> so Thank it's you. a it's lovely yeah but uh you know another thing what you said like work is worship and you're like uh, looking inwards so your paintings have a lot of that meditative quality and i can see that you know you're also relying on yoga traditions and uh the bee the brambari you know the asan and you've done a lot of that motif so could you talk about that like you know how it's in your paintings and how it's also expanded your own consciousness and uh how deep have you dived you know into this Really, I suppose. Um, I suppose yoga. I started yoga as well when I came out to India. That's kind of, in a way, an obvious thing. But it, but we definitely, um, and particularly when I, when I was, um, when I was learning the traditional form of, of in, in the early two thousands, as opposed to when I first came out and was quite it itinerant in the early two thousands when I, when we came out again with our families, uh, with our family in tow, and um. I used I had this yoga teacher same same one I have now but and I um she is from she is from the Nart um sort of sect of yoga and that kind of I had no it it was the most extraordinary thing because I had been so I was really excited by um this these paintings that I saw in Jodhpur uh, of from the early 19th century man singh's reign um when he uh, had the uh, these uh, he got very obsessed by the nart sect in jodhpur and they um and commissioned them to co commission paintings about um uh, about meditation really and about um um and uh, uh, involving these these nats and their, I, I guess, position and hierarchy within society um, in Jodhpur, and I found them extraordinary and 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 um, and incredibly contemporary. They, there were these 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 long. Um, this was the first time I'd seen um, large miniature painting. Even before I'd seen the Natadvara ones, that they were long, monumental miniatures, as they're known, uh, with long kind of um, with fields of color, fields of these sacred oceans that were just pink. You know, for, for six foot, it was just pink, repetitive imagery that went along. And I just felt, my goodness, this could be kind of this could be op art. It was something that you 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 disappeared into and you 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 felt completely immersed in. And there was I doing um I'd got very excited about that, but there was I also doing yoga in a very it, um this 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 not form of um this um yoga has a very visual side to it um and with visualizations and so color suddenly and and shape and form um was absolutely part and parcel of my yoga practice um and i felt very excited about that i felt how extraordinary and um i suppose possibly very um indian in a way you know to have all these things always into inter intersecting you know you, you they um you, you know one thing is never just one thing you know you you do you you do something and it's always got so many other elements to it that cross kind of um cross borders in a way cross borders of kind of you know art and music and um um and art you know all the all the five senses all come together and this this i found very much in this very extraordinary meditative art form that i saw from the um, from Man Singh's reign, and I 
decided to sort of use that as a sort of again as a starting point I suppose more for my my more recent work um how to how to kind of transmit these ideas because I found also meditation a wonderful way um this visual form a wonderful way of sort of I don't know um it, it was something that meant some, a lot to me um and still does and so it was a way of kind of finding this this vocabulary that um that could show uh and and books I'd be reading uh, books about it. There's this wonderful um, 17th century, um, uh, no, uh, early 1700s, so early 18th century um, Sanskrit text called the uh, Giranda Samhita, um, and um, in trying to describe um, Dhyana, you know, the visual form of, of 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 meditation, because I'd been in a way trying to do that myself with my my artworks. Um, and because also painting, I found painting in this tradition was so meditative, trying to get that perfect kind of spiral or, or you know, using, as I say, with the breath work, the, the, with that single brush, the, trying, to, trying to reach for these, these, these lines, these rhythms, these, 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 these circles and spirals and whatever. Um, it was it was meditative to actually paint as well as what I was trying to talk about. And anyway, this this um, this book, uh, the Geranda Samita, um, had this beautiful vision. Has this beautiful vision? Um, I've got it here. Actually, I could read it to you. Um, shall I read it to you? <laughs> There's this idea yes, of the yes, yogi. Please, please read. Yeah. <laughs> The yogi should visualize a sublime motion of nectar in his heart with an island of jewels in its middle, whose sand is made of gemstones. And in every direction there are kadamba trees with abundant flowers, and it is ringed with thick kadamba forests like a stockade, where the scents of Malati, Malika, Jati, Kesra, Champa, Parijata, and Stalapadma flowers perfume every corner. And in its middle, the yogi should imagine an enchanting, wish-fulfilling tree whose four branches are the four Vedas and which permanently bears flowers and fruit. Bees and cuckoos buzz and call there. He should steady himself and visualise a great jewelled pavilion. I just I just got very, um, very kind of excited by the idea of words, um, the idea of, um, you know, practice of, of gesture, of, of trying to create the idea of visualisations, mental you know, inner vision, the inner vision that's 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 at the the background and at the base of this artwork form, um, all there, you know, as a kind of subject to to try and I don't know to try and um, put out there to try and put out there, and so I also felt that I I wanted to. Um, show the idea of this the of the senses and and the the, the business I, I mean breath is the key one which is the key one when you're painting as well but um the the key thing but this the, the senses of uh, of all the five senses and so when i was trying to do the i when i was i did this one painting i i've endlessly painted the lotus which is one of the, obviously the key um elements of of yogic practice which is you know you, you concentrate on on the lotus and it and expands and contracts with your breath opening and shutting with your breath and it obviously it has the the chakras and various people think of how many chakras there are within the body the idea of the the connection bet between within and without with the body and the cosmos around you um and i was also thinking um I want to see if I can push this medium even further and use ideas from poetry um, and um, that perhaps haven't been, you know, necessarily depicted so much in the in the visual language of 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 painting. And so I was thinking about the bee because um, and the bee uh, is such it's something that's so important to our world at the moment. You know, our world where you know you if you you know get worried about this whole business of climate yeah. and all of that climate you know, change bees, and everything yeah yeah the bees are pivotal to you know to 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 creating our beautiful gardens to to you know to 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 pollinating our flowers our plants our our our, 
our um our, our fruit um and um without the bee then what you know so i was just um and 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 also i've become a beekeeper <laughs> as well <laughs> really <laughs> It's all true to our existence, almost. If you look at it, <laughs> um, so I, I I used to be terrified of bees, but um, but we've now got well, we had one one hive in Delhi, and now we've got uh, they've hived off, and then they come back, and we've got six now, which possibly are a bit too small, and possibly we need to put them together a bit. But anyway, um, the, it's fascinating just sitting near them. You know, I used to be terrified and never want to go near a bee because of terrified of being stung. But actually, just watch them. They're busy doing their own thing. They're busy getting on with their lives. And, you know, they've got a whole whole kind of, you know, waggle way of and dance way of behavior. And you could see them coming back laden with all their precious kind of pollen or whatever. It's it's an extraordinary world. But I, I wanted to bring in the bee because I just felt that that's a sort of it's something that's so con connected to this whole business of, um, um, I suppose, two in one. I suppose is it? Uh, I don't know that. And and I felt that the lotus and the bee, you know, the 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 the, the flower, and and the, you know, and then there's all this visual. There's all all this vocabulary. All this, sorry, all this um, um, this poetry around Krishna and and the bee, um, and. Uh, Krishna is often thought of as 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 um, going from flower to flower, from gopi to gopi, because he's kind of so he's he's so handsome and charming. Or you see, or the idea of women whose whose eyes are like bees, going off into the distance, watching um, as they watch out for Krishna. Or they're covered in a they're surrounded in a halo of bees. It's 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 all about um, um, the imagery and the poetry is all about sort of desire and all about um, um, fruitfulness and ripeness and um, I suppose to get togetherness that with with Krishna. So this this whole and so anyway, I wanted to use the whole that idea um, in the idea of Brahmani because um, I there's this asana this asana um, where you close all your senses with your hands and then you. Um, you 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 make the sound and then well I'll describe it here it is described in the Geranda Samita slowly draw in um, it says it's it, it's where you shut out it's an, uh, where you shut out the senses your eyes ears and partially your nose and then here I quote slowly draw in air and perform Brahmri Kumbhaka exhale it very slowly and then the sound of a bee will arise and on hearing the sound of a bee from within leave the mind there. Samadhi will occur together with the bliss arising from the realization I am that. And the the amazing thing for me was that when I was I, I wasn't introduced by my own yogi, yogi, yogi teacher to yoga teacher to to this Burmary um asana. I I, I was doing a, a yoga class in Goa, I think, and just I think it was me and one other and, and the, the yoga teacher, and I'd never done that before, and I was just amazed and um it it felt there's something kind of reverberating and I got very excited about it so I wanted to paint this um and so I painted it with bees and lotuses and almost the bees becoming lotuses and the bees kind of that multiple be bees with so many wings that almost like god god goddesses with their millions of wings and then the wings and the bees and almost it so and it separates and it's a circular thing and then it separates and it becomes almost a flower i can't describe it anyway but this is uh i can't describe my, my own painting but there's a trip no, no i guess we have to see the painting for that i've seen them so i know what you're <laughs> talking about yeah. yeah yeah so so that's where that one came about yeah you also there's an artwork i saw which is also the kundalini and you know so i guess um uh, yoga has uh, been quite central also to your work absolutely um completely central i mean it's not always about that but it's been it's 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 my finding that vocabulary and, and thinking about it and thinking about what it you know how, thinking about how to you know what what it means and um thinking about iconography and i don't know and also thinking in terms again always in terms of you know who am I? I'm, 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 who am I? Uh, uh, how can I be me sort of thing? Um, 
this this hybrid thing that I am, this person who lives in, you know, quite a lot of my time, if not most of my life, has been lived in India. Um, but I also have Scottish Scottish English roots. Um, how, how how can that work out? You know, brought up brought up a, a Catholic and living within this 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 multiverse, which is India, which has so many different sides to it. But um, and being excited by this. This, this this form of I suppose spiritual art um and um yeah so so that's where I've ended up uh so you know I'm just curious how much uh, I mean you practically Indian I mean you and your husband have lived here so long so how does it work um how Indian do you feel when you're there in the UK is it like an Indian living in the UK now for you and as a family what are the uh, cultures that you've adopted that are very, very Indian in your own day-to-day -day life and, you know, how you conduct your day. To a certain extent, and I don't know whether other people find this, it's it's like, um, I don't know whether you've read those Narnia books, going in and out of the of the cupboard, out of one world into another, <laughs> into Narnia, and then you come back through the cupboard, you know, the wardrobe, and you close the door and you're back in this other world. It's a little bit like that. It's, it's a very strange thing where... I can't really imagine. I can't. I'm now currently in in England, and I can't quite imagine my life over in India. And when I'm in India, my life is so fully, you know, you know, in, ensconced in my Indian life that I can't quite imagine my life back over in England. So it's it's a strange thing. I, obviously, I am the you know the thing that's going backwards between the two. Um, you know, we love Indian food. I'm always wearing my clothes that I get in India that's what how I dress um so if people think I'm dressing unusually in this part of the world well I don't know that's it is what it is um I love the kind of layered kind of I like the anyway I, I have a particular way of I suppose <laughs> using Indian clothes um and I you know I'm I'm still reading you know Indian books and I get very excited going to um any exhibitions that may have something from you know the subcontinent or whatever over here um but i don't know i i as i say it's it's a little bit like the wardrobe i you know i i, I then spring into my you know, back into my family from the uk and my english life and then i go back in through the wardrobe again and i spring into my other life out and so i don't know i don't really know <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a great way of explaining it actually it's perfect <laughs> And uh, uh, sorry, I was going to ask you, you know, you uh, which are the Indian uh, artists that you follow? You said you go to a lot of exhibitions when you hear of them. Oh, I love, um, well, I love Bharti Kerr, Subodh Gupta, obviously, and um, Anish Kapoor, although I particularly love his early stuff. I think his early stuff is amazing. Um, and then I also love, um, you know, the people who've really taken miniature painting on. Quite a lot of them are from... Um, the, the the National College of Art in in Lahore, um, and so Shazia Sikandar, she's now based in 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 New York. Um, Aisha Khalid, Imran Qureshi, um, people like that, um, and they've they've very much used the, the the tradition that I'm really excited about, um, and taken that onwards and upwards. Partly because I feel that they, you know, were in their in the college where they all learnt the same actual same art college. That was absolutely part and parcel. There was a you know traditional Indian um, artist who 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 taught them um, right at the beginning, and it become it's central to their practice, and you can see it carrying on um, in various in various ways. Right, and uh, you also uh, I think you've also been introduced by uh, sorry not introduced you've been also influenced by Western artists I think. Uh, the classics and uh, you know while you're telling me about that I also want to hear some stories that your great aunt told you about her encounters with Salvador Dali and Picasso etc. <laughs> well um, yeah I mean my great aunt has been a huge in in influence I, I was brought up in in London and she lived um, as well as Scotland but in London for my day-to-day -day school life and um, and she lived around the corner Eileen Agar she was one of the um, her life spanned the 20th century. She was born in 1899, died in 1991. And um, she was one of the very few women surrealists, surrealist artists. And Eileen um, Agar, right? Eileen Agar, A-G-A-R. Agar. Agar. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
and she had the most extraordinary life along with my grandmother you know they were they were brought up in in uh, again the other side of the world rather like my life being divided between london you know uk and and india her life similarly started off she started off in argentina and um a lot of her work um has been and you know she didn't go backwards and forwards on airplanes like we do today she was it was about long sea journeys and that obviously kind of really um, um, became influenced her a lot because a, a lot of her her surrealist and well basically art was was about was using flotsam and jetsam. She would walk along um, along uh, beaches and just pick up this you know pick up bits and pieces um, that she'd find on the on the beach and then create these wonderful hybrid sculptures. Um, and she describes at one one time when, when she was on holiday, she was she went to live in in France at one point um, during the in late twenties, early thirties, and met all the kind of you know all the great artists. Picasso was a friend, um, you know, Salvador Dali was a friend, uh, Paul Nash, and uh, Paul Nash was in England, but uh, Paul Eloire and you know, the writers and painters of the day, Lee Miller, she was a she was a great friend, um, and. Um, they all went on holiday apparently at one point in Mougins in the south of France. And Eileen describes how, you know, she was just going up and down um, again, collecting whatever, you know, she could find on the seashore. And back in those days, um, she, she came back with a with a, a um, an arm full of ladies' heels, wooden heels, uh, shoe heels, which apparently was the flotsam and jetsam that she found on that particular beach, something you wouldn't find anymore. It'd be plastic bags kind of thing more like. But um, but back in those days, it was a lot of ladies, you know, high heel shoes. Uh, and she laid them, apparently laid them at the feet of Picasso uh, as a form of, in a way, because back in those days, you know, he was he was he was always at the top of his game, worshipped by everybody, kind of all the painters around. They all thought he was the great maestro. But what I particularly loved about Eileen was the fact that she um, kind of inverts that uh, whole business of, you know, she was behaving like a kind of, you know, um, a chela to the guru. But there, and there was this big thing um, of of these great male artists with their female muses. Um, and uh, and she inverts that. She does this wonderful kind of extraordinary, surreal kind of um, painting, huge, great one of someone sitting in exactly the position that she'd taken photographs. Oh, it's a it's a sort of human figure of sorts, um, but she calls it muse. And it was it was her. Um, it was Picasso. It's, it's it's in the position that he had a very kind of I don't know half squatting on the beach in his kind of quite bullish sort of presence um and it's it's an extraordinary she she and she used also her 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 lover um who was a hungarian um philosopher and hungarian called joseph bard she used him as also her her muse so she kind of inverted it to the men being you know the, um and she, he became the the um um, she, she did this fantastic um, sculpture of a head called the Angel of Anarchy that now lives in the in the Tate in, in London, um, where she she sculpted his head and then um, thought it looked a bit um, sort of bare or whatever. And so she then got all of her her mother who had all these exotic silks and used to ha apparently have a hundred hats. She take whenever she went to the beach. Her mother was a great hat wearer. Um, back in the early early 20th century and um, I guess and Eileen had pulled these things apart and had all these strange you know wonderful bits of material fabric and 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 beads and and um, you know shells and um, feathers and she she just wound them all around and created this extraordinary um, I don't know um, half sculpture, half kind of collage sculpture, most amazing um, piece of imagery. Um, and she called it the Angel of Anarchy. And I just, uh, A, she was always very brilliant with her titles, but B, she really made you, she had this kind of extra, extraordinary strength and confidence of, of um, artistic confidence, which is something I really, um, uh, you know, loved in in her, and she she was brilliant raconteur with all her um, her stories of her 
extraordinary life because she was great. She, you know, she traveled a lot um, and, um, and the artists and the, and the, the people that she met. Um, so she, and she had this extraordinary sense of color and um, pattern and um, design. And that's pe- perhaps that's something that's very much um, so- been something that I've perhaps been influenced, in- influenced by. And this whole business of the sea again, there's this wonderful malachite sort of sea sky blue that seems to you know, weave its way through a lot of her artwork, through a lot of her paintings. And again, that seems to be some a color that I use again and again. I don't know. I mean, there's ways in which you don't quite know how you have been influenced or not. But I used to love going and visiting my great aunt as a child, as a as a, you know, as a teenager. And each time I went to visit her in her flat, she would have moved all the paintings in her studio flat and um, of her work. She'd have them from floor to ceiling, you know, all over the place, uh, mixed in with uh, artworks from her contemporaries, you know, Henry Moore, Paul Nash, um, um, all these sort of people. Um, and um, it would be kind of like a game. You'd go there and she'd say, and 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 I would try and sort of play a game with with her about which artworks she'd shifted and what she'd replaced them with. And um, and she was she was fun. She was a great fun. And I suppose I've been attracted to, you know, art, artists who've travelled, explored the world. Um, you know, I've I, I've loved the the paintings that Gauguin have, has done with his, um, although not necessarily. You know, there's there's elements to the Gauguin world that you know is is not necessarily one that one should you know appreciate today but um but his sense of color and rhythm and um um and Rousseau another guy who didn't travel but he traveled in himself in his in his in his um um in his imagination and so he, he he painted you know wonderful this fantastic jungle um where he's never been you know further than france you know he was a whatever he was i can't remember what he was a post office worker or something and he had never um he, he never traveled but he just he, in his imagination he did and he created this fantastic kind of um painting full of stripes stripes of tiger stripes of leaves stripes of of of, of weather just a stripy painting that that just filled my imagination as as a, as as a uh, as as a child. I got very excited about that. So there we go. And then of course there's op art, which I get I get hugely excited with as well. That's again a form of, you know, it's about uh, you, you're looking at you're 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 exchanging. You're having this exchange of you. you whenever you look at an artwork it's it's about you looking and and what you get from the artwork and the artwork is is possibly there's a sort of exchange um and of vision and and that's particularly the case where with with op art where it, things can fizz and change and shift as according to where you move across across it or how you're looking at it or i don't know there's uh, so Bridget Riley, she's a she's a brilliant. Um, I, I think she's absolutely brilliant um, with her with her artwork as well. So, yeah, I love the way you've explained it all. I could almost just see everything, just visualize every little thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no. yeah. So, uh, tell me, is there anything you're working on currently? So, I just finished um, a group of paintings that's going to be going towards a. Uh, big solo show in New York. So that's going to be in November, uh, the Sundaram Tagore Gallery. And um, so I've just literally finished that. So it's a question of now kind of um, just re getting together with myself. I've, you know, I've just done this big solo. So I just now need to try and think what next. So I'm, I'm in a, in that in-between stage, the, 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 the white piece of paper is sitting in front of me uh, at the moment. And and ideas are, are sort of coming in at the corners. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, your thinking chair will give you all the answers, probably. Yeah. Some of yeah. them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Olivia. It's been so, so wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much. Very good to talk to you too. Thank you. <laughs>